Let me invite us to open our Bibles to a familiar text, but yet one that we must understand in a little more depth. Luke's Gospel, the first chapter. In just a moment, we'll read together once again verses 26 through verse 35. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 26 through 35. Before we stand and read that text, let me give us some information that I believe will hit this, uh, set the stage for what we need to see about the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? We want the witnesses of the Word of God to come forth and tell us, based on the Scripture, who Jesus Christ is. In a recent poll released concerning Christmas, when asked what makes Christmas important to them, only one-third of American adults in that national survey said the birth of Jesus, only one-third. Forty-four percent said family time is the most important part of the three sacred days each year, Good Friday, Easter, and Christmas. Jesus Christ has been evacuated from Christmas, said theologian Reverend William Willman, Duke University chaplain. Poster George Barner, a Barner Research Group, said, quote, I was surprised even all that I knew about how secularized our culture had become. I would have thought that more people would say Christmas, the birth of Jesus, end quote. The survey included 1,006 adults, and almost 9 out of 10 of those claimed to have a relationship to Jesus by being a, quote, Christian. But only 37%, 37% said the birth of Jesus was important as the aspect of Christmas. Among those who describe themselves as theological liberals, only 24% placed Jesus first in relationship to Christmas. There were significant age differences, however. You've heard me talk about that age difference. when it fi We find it in what's called the millennial age group. 26% of the millennial age group, 18 to 35, said Jesus' birth was the most important aspect of Christmas, 26%. And may I say only 26%. 39% of those 65 years old and older said Jesus was the most important thing about Christmas. The studies reveal that people really have no idea of why we're singing joy to the world at Christmas time. So we need to understand what the Bible says of what the angels and others represent as witnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word. And as I read audibly, follow with me in your Scripture silently. Luke's Gospel, the first chapter, verses 26 through 35, we refer to it as the uh, announcement of the birth of Jesus. I call it the announcement of the first Christmas. And then when you see the birth story, it's the arrival of the first Christmas. But now we want to talk about the witnesses, testimony of the witnesses, Listen carefully. And in six months, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named uh, Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored of the Lord, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou hast conceived in thy womb, and uh, in thy womb, and shall bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Thank you, and we may be seated. We are said to live in a pluralistic society today. Now, I don't know exactly that connotation of that. 
I know how it works out in the minds of the liberals and the minds of those that are politically correct. But in a so-called society that's pluralistic, it seems that more and more we're being expected to yield our Christian values and our Christian faith and our Christian norms to the hand, into the hands of those that are anti-Christ and anti-church and anti-God. It seems as though there's the mindset that as Christians, we should be pushed aside and allow the, as I call it, the loose likes lost liberals and their uh, political persuasions to be in the marketplace of ideas. And as Christians, we have no ideas, nor do we have any rights, as it seems by society standards today. There seems to be a subtle yet very open movement to completely remove the Christ of Christmas in society today. In fact, in most school systems, the governmentally controlled schools called the public school system, they will not allow a Christmas tree to be decorated with uh, red and green simply because that represents Christmas as they see it. Most schools will not even allow a Christmas tree. The municipalities, back a number of years ago here in the city, at the federal courthouse building, they had uh, all of the leadership that's in charge of the maintenance and upkeep of the building had placed in the rotunda of the federal courthouse a beautiful, well-decorated Christmas tree with Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Santa Claus at the base of the tree. It was deemed to be uh, non-acceptable because it represented Christ and Christmas. Therefore, it was summarily ordered to be removed by the federal chief judge, and they put in its place then a tinsel, uh, silver-looking tree with no semblance of Christ or Christmas or anything that would relate to Christmas in that fashion. Yes, we're living in a day that in the pluralistic society, Christians are supposed to step aside. Several years ago, there was a movement to refer to Christmas is Xmas. You might remember those days. Xmas. X is that which is the unknown quantity. It is the unknown equation in math. Christians came out publicly on a large scale across America and demanded that the marketplace and that the uh, stores and the shops and the shopping centers change that Xmas from their windows and start to do something about it. We had a little modicum of success with that, but today it seems as though Christians have been silenced in relationship to our stand for Christ and for Christmas. The manger scene, the cross, anything that will resemble Christ or Christmas today is being rejected and not accepted in the norms of the marketplace of ideas. Uh, one local school just a couple of years back, in fact, it was about three years ago, one of our local schools uh, focusing on Christmas, they included Christ Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. They explained that each except Christmas, they explained everything about each of those except explaining Christmas. I believe we've forgotten who we should focus on and the purpose that we should focus on at this Christmas season. So therefore, I want us to think on the subject, the testimony of the witnesses, the testimony of the witnesses. Any courthouse, any court proceedings, the witness is supposed to carry weight with the reality of what's taking place. Howbeit, I must state that there is an exception to that rule. If it is in Jerry Nadler's court, the kangaroo court of Washington, in hearing from witnesses, you have four people that are supposed to supposedly knowledgeable professors of constitutional law that absolutely destroyed anything that would be called a testimony from a solid witness in that setting. But from the Word of God, we find absolute witnesses as to the question, who is Jesus Christ? So as we think on the subject, the testimony of the witnesses, I want to see the witness of the seraphs that's talking about the angels, the testimony of the seraphs recorded. Secondly, I want us to notice the witness of the shepherds revealed. And thirdly, the witness of the Savior recited. We've already seen the witness of the Scripture, the witness of the servants, and the witness of the saints. The three other witnesses that I want to call to our attention and ask the question, who is Jesus Christ? As you look at this text that is before us in uh, Luke's Gospel, the first chapter, verses 26 and following, we see the witness of the seraph recorded. Uh, God sent an announcing angel, Gabriel, to make the announcement to Mary that she was going to have a child, and that child's name would be called Jesus. I want us to notice, first of all, who is Jesus Christ? First of all, he is Savior. He is Savior. In fact, the Scripture says 
in the uh, Matthew text, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I want us to realize, according to the Bible, Jesus uh, uh, came to save us from our sins. Listen very carefully. What if Jesus Christ had never been born? What if Jesus Christ had never entered the world? What if God had never come in the form of man? There would be no church. There'd be no Christian. There'd be no looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There would be nothing that we would consider today as spirituality or Christianity had Jesus Christ not come. Jesus Christ is Savior, and without him, the world would have no salvation. Jesus Christ is Savior, according to the text. Jesus Christ is the Savior of mankind. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus came, gave his life on Calvary's cross, that through our faith and trust in him, we might have everlasting life. The world doesn't recognize him. The world rejects him. The agnostics ridicule him. The atheists deny him. But John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of of the world. He is Savior. The question that begs to be asked and answered is Jesus Christ your Savior today? There are a lot of people that have gone through life. Multitudes are good people, been member of multitudes of churches. They've done some good things, said some good things, live a good life. But unless you've said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, Jesus Christ is not your Savior. Multitudes have the philosophy and the feeling that somehow, some way, I can join the church and I can buy my ticket, and then on that occasion when life leaves this body, I can enter in and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. We have those in the House and the Senate in Washington that believe that when a person dies, he is dancing with the angels, as one recently said, whether they have lived a Christian life or not, whether they've had any relationship to Jesus Christ or not. But Jesus Christ is the Savior. He came into the world to save his people from the their sins. The greatest gift that you can give on Christmas, at this Christmas season, the greatest gift that a human being can give is our hearts, our lives, surrendered and submissive under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When we have redemption through Jesus Christ shed blood, Jesus Christ is the only one that can redeem us, the only one that can reconcile us between God and man, and that's what Jesus Christ did when he came and died on Calvary's cross. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Not only do we see he is Savior, but I want us to notice he is sovereign. He is sovereign. In Matthew's Gospel, the first chapter, verse 20 and uh, through 23, verse 23 in particular, the scripture says this in Matthew's gospel, chapter 1. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means, which is interpreted God with us. May I remind us that Jesus Christ is not only Savior, he is sovereign. In fact, in John chapter 1, verses 1 and following, it talks about the fact that Jesus Christ is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Talking about Jesus Christ as being God come in the flesh. There's an old song that says, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. And that's who Jesus Christ is. He is Savior and he is sovereign. He is the one that is God come in the flesh. In John 8 verse 58, Jesus Christ dealing with his distractors and they were trying to cast doubt and dispersion at him. And Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And all we need to do is go back to Exodus chapter 3 and realize when Moses said to God, God, who should I tell them sent me? And he said, tell them that I am that I am had sent thee. I am is speaking of the thrice holy God. And here Jesus Christ is saying, I am God. Before Abraham was, I preexisted. I was in existence before Abraham came into existence. By the way, that didn't cure the problem. It made them more irate with him and made them more determined to uh, destroy his life. May I remind us, Jesus Christ is before Abraham. He is the I am. In fact, in John 
chapter 17, verse 5 and verse 24, and may I read them. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before pros in front of the world, before the world was. And then in verse 50, verse 25, I believe it is, in chapter 17, verse 24. In verse 24, the scripture then says, Father, I will that thou also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Pointing out the preexistence of Christ. We make the mistake in Christianity, I believe, sometimes unknowingly, sometimes unwittingly, and sometimes simply out of ignorance, biblical ignorance, because we worship that babe in Bethlehem. And we want to focus on that babe. But Jesus Jesus Christ is no longer a babe. He is Lord. He is Master. He is Savior. He is Sovereign. He is the one that's seated on the throne that is in control of this old universe. He is Sovereign. In His Sovereignty, He is Creator, according to Colossians 1.15 and following. Colossians 1.15 and following says this. May I read that for us? It says, who is the image, speaking of the previous verses, speaking of Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and are, uh, on the, are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he, speaking of Jesus, is before, pros, in front of all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, for in that in all things he might have preeminence. He is first, foremost, and final, because he is sovereign. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, no longer that babe in Bethlehem. But the witnesses speak, and the witness that is speaking here in these texts are simply the angel that's announcing to Mary that you're going to have a son. His name is called Jesus, because he is going to save his people from their sin, according to the word of God. He is creator. It is Je when you, By the way, this is so fascinating when you analyze Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is God that created the heavens and the earth. But the Bible says in Colossians 1, verse 15 through 18, that Jesus Christ is the God that created everything that's visible, everything that's invisible, everything that's on the earth, everything that's beneath the earth, everything that's in the heavens. It is God. Jesus Christ is sovereign. He is the one that is in control of this old world. Not only is he the creator, but he is also controller. In that same text in Colossians 1.17, it says that he, by him, all things consist. If you put it in the young blood vernacular, Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh, and that God, which is Jesus, is the one that controls everything in this old world. He is the divine superglue that holds it all together. He's the one that holds this old world in place. He's the one that prevents this world from spinning off its axis. And if it goes one direction, just a uh, micro uh, second of a uh, distance one way, we could freeze to death. Another direction, we could melt because Jesus Christ is God. He is sovereign. He holds it all in his hand. As the little song that was sung so many years ago, he's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. And that's talking about Jesus Christ as being the sovereign controller of this old world. I said on several occasions down through the years in teaching in the classroom and from the pulpit, if I didn't believe that Jesus Christ was sovereign, if I didn't believe that he was in control, I wouldn't want to wake up in the morning. I'd be fearful that Nancy Pelosi would be the one in control. She thinks she is, but she's not, by the way. I want us to understand that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. In John 1, 18, the scripture is very clear that Jesus Christ came to exegete God, to reveal God. Jesus Christ came into the world. God incarnate, God Emmanuel, God with us, came into the world that Jesus Christ in his humanity might reveal God in his glory to all of mankind. We would not know God except for knowing him through Jesus Christ. May I remind us, the scripture says that he is the Savior. He is sovereign. But I want us to notice, Jesus is not just that babe in Bethlehem. He is Savior and he's sovereign. But I want us to see, not only the witness of the seraph recorded, but the witness of the shepherds revealed. Turn in your Bibles to Luke's Gospel, the second chapter, verses 20 and following. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Verses 8 through 20. And we read these words. This is the arrival of Christmas, if you look at it 
from that standpoint of titles in relationship to this particular text. But look at verses 8 and following in chapter 2 of Luke. And there were the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring thee good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there were with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. In verse 15 and falling, and it came to pass that the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered of those things which were told of them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returning, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as was told unto them. I want us to notice the witness of the shepherds. The shepherds were the first one to go to where Jesus Christ was. The, uh, the angel had uh, uh, spoken to them. The angel had frightened them in their announcement, in their out in the fields doing their work, watching the flock by night. But the angel of God spoke to them, and he told the angel, shared with them, gave them instructions. Notice the special announcement found in that verses 8 through 14. The announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ came, first of all, to what I call ordinary, lowly human beings. The announcement of the birth of Jesus didn't go to the potentates and the princes and the presidents and the prime ministers around the globe. The announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ did not first go to the elite and to the important. The announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ did not first go to those that were renowned in name and recognition. The announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ was first made, that special announcement, to the shepherds uh, out in the field. The shepherds were told, verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's the special announcement. I want to ask a question. It's just out of a hypothetical sense of what would you do? How would you have responded? How would we respond today if that announcement came to us that there's an individual that's been born in the world and his name is Jesus Christ. He is Savior. He's come to save his people from their sins. How would you respond to such an announcement? The angel told them what had happened who he was, and how to identify him, and where he would be found. I want us to notice not only the special announcement, but notice in verses 15 through 20 of that Gospel of Luke text in chapter 2, the submissive attitude. This is how the shepherds responded. This ought to be the response of every child of God. This ought to be the response of every Christian today in particular at this season called Christmas. This should be our response any time we think about the name of Jesus. This should be our response every time we study the Scripture. This should be our response every time we analyze and look at that Jesus Christ is Savior, He is sovereign, and He's coming to this world to save man from their sins. Notice this submissive attitude in verses 15 through 20. Notice, first of all, and it came to pass as the angel had gone away from heaven, uh, gone away unto heaven, the shepherd said unto one to another. Notice what the shepherd says, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. I want us to notice in this text, I want us to understand their decision. Their decision. They had a submissive attitude. The angel of the Lord spoke to them. They recognized that this was a message from God. They recognized that this was a heavenly message, a divine message, and they had a submissive attitude that we're going to do something about it. We're going to respond to this announcement. Their decision, they said, let us now go, is indicative of the urgency in their hearts, indicative of the urgency they felt when they heard the announcement. They said, they didn't say, let's have a prayer meeting. They didn't say, let's call together. 
a group and vote and decide on what we need to do. They didn't call a group together and say, "What guys, what do you think we should do? This is what we've heard. This is what we've seen. Let's cast lots or let's vote on it and make some decision. They said, let us now go. That decision was a decision of urgency. That decision was a decision based on what the word of God had said to them, that word coming via the angel in speaking to them. Each person might, uh, must make a choice. We must decide. We must make a decision about who Jesus Christ is. It's an impossibility to be neutral in the question, who is Jesus Christ? Albeit there are a number of people today that want to be neutral about it and are those that want to argue and debate and somehow diminish the truth of who Jesus Christ is. We see their decision. But notice their discovery in that 16th verse. And they came with haste. It was with absolute urgency, uh, no waiting, no delay. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. They found Jesus. They found Jesus. Just as the uh, angel had said that they would, they found the Lord Jesus Christ. May I remind us they found Jesus, but you just uh, must imagine their hearts, how their hearts overflowed with getting there and seeing the truth of what the angel had said. They found Mary and Joseph and Jesus Christ, God incarnate, God come in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, there in that manger scene. I want us to realize the Messiah had come. Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord, is born. This is why we ought to sing that old song in praising him, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. We should sing praises to God for the Lord Jesus Christ in his first coming. We should sing praises to God for the record of his birth and the uh, prophecy of his soon coming again. We should, as Christians, look forward to with great anticipation, not in his first coming, we've seen that, but uh, embracing that first coming and receiving him as Savior and then embracing the truth of the prophetic text that Jesus Christ is coming and and is coming again very soon. Jesus Christ is available to all who seek him. These lowly shepherds went out in the urgency of seeking to find Jesus as the announcement had been made to them. We see their decision. We see their discovery. But notice their delight in verses 17 through 20. The scripture says, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad, the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all that they had heard, that had heard it wondered, that were amazed, that word means amazed. They were amazed at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returning, glorifying, praising God for all the things that they had heard and had seen as it was told unto them. Notice their delight. They found Jesus Christ, and once they were introduced to Jesus, listen, there could not be any silence anymore in their lives. They had to tell everybody everywhere that they had found Jesus Christ. Just a little parenthetical footnote on that statement. I believe that as Christians, one of the proof positive evidences of our relationship to Jesus, we're unafraid to tell others about Christ. We're unafraid to tell others who Jesus Christ is. We're not fearful of intimidation or in any way being demeaned or in any Anyway, dissed as the world calls it today, we're willing to speak forth the truth of who Jesus Christ is without fear, without intimidation about that fact of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Savior. Jesus Christ is Sovereign. Jesus Christ is Creator. Jesus Christ is Controller. And the Lord Jesus Christ, once discovered by these shepherds, could not be silent any longer. Notice, it changed their lives. They could not remain the same. Notice in their delight, but verses 17 and following. Verse 17, they were the first witnesses. The first witnesses. They told everyone that they met. Notice the scripture says, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. What were they told? What were they told? They were told that he's Savior. They told they were told that he is the Messiah that had been promised for all of those years, that he is Messiah that's come, that he is Christ, he is the Lord. They were witnesses, and then the ultimate result of their finding Jesus and witnessing who he is. Can you imagine as they were leaving 
and all the way back to their workplace, all the way back to their home, all the way back to their villages, all the way back to the streets that they would walk on each day. All they could talk about, we have found Jesus. We have seen the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen Yeshua Messiah. We have been introduced to him. Verse 18 through 20 says, They returned glorifying. That means giving honor and praising God for all that they had seen, all that they had heard, and all that they had seen as it was told unto them. The reality of Jesus Christ as Savior, the reality of Jesus Christ as God come in the flesh, gripped their very hearts, and they worshiped him and praised him and honored him and wanted everybody to know about Jesus Christ and who he is. One of the greatest things that we can do after we've met Jesus, celebrating and serving the Lord Jesus Christ, is to tell others, is to tell others. Not only do we see the witness of the seraphs recorded and the witness of the shepherds revealed, but I want us to understand the witness of the Savior recited. The witness of the Savior recited. Who does Jesus say that he is? Who does Jesus say that he is? Matthew 27 and verse 43 says this. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, speaking of Jesus, he said, I am the son of God. You have multitudes of the loose likes lost liberals today that say there's no place in the scripture that Jesus Christ ever affirmed his full deity and that he's God come in the flesh. Over and over and over you find in the scripture where Jesus is claiming to be God, where Jesus says that he is God, that Jesus testifies and identifies himself as God, God with us. And then in Mark's gospel, the 14th chapter, verses 61 and 62, thou art the Christ, the son of the blessed one. And Jesus said, I am I am. Go back again to the Exodus 3 text. Moses says, who should I tell the people that sent me? God says, tell them I am that I am hath sent thee. It is the reference to the thrice holy God. Jesus Christ is recognizing and is saying to the world and those about him in that day, I am Jehovah. I am God. I am Yahshua Messiah. I am the one that's been promised for all of these centuries and now I have come. According to the scripture, let me just give you the little narrative in a brief synoptic overview of who Jesus Christ says that he is according to the scripture. According to the scripture, Jesus is the first and the last. He is the rock of ages, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the rose of Sharon, the cornerstone, the refiner, the alpha and the omega, the son of God, wonderful counselor, the bread of life, prince of peace, the bridegroom, the light of the world, the way, the truth and the life, the bread of life and the mighty God, the everlasting father. That's who the Bible says that Jesus Christ is. That's the witness of the scripture again of who Jesus is. But let's hear the testimony directly from Jesus. Who does he say that he is? What does the scripture say in relationship to that? Let me just read to you a whole litany of those statements without going into great detail on each of them as we close. Jesus is the best witness of all of the scripture in relationship to who he is. And Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. He is Lord. He is Savior. He is King of kings and Lord of lords and soon coming again. Jesus says to the agnostic, I am the way, John 14, 6. Jesus says to the blind, I'm the light of the world, John 8, 12. Jesus says to the believer, I am the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. Jesus says to the farmer, I am the vine, in John 15, 5. Jesus says to the historian, I'm the first and the last, Revelation 1, 8. Jesus says to the hungry, I'm the bread of life, John 6, 48 and John 6, 35. Jesus says to the lonely, I'm with you always, even to the end. Matthew 28, verse 20. Jesus says to the lost, I am Christ. Matthew 24 and verse 5. Jesus says to the philosopher, I am truth. John 14, 6. Jesus says to the physician, I am life. Jesus and John 14, 6. Jesus says to the sheep, I am the good shepherd. In John 10, 11 and 14. Jesus says to the thirsty, I am the living waters. John 4, John 4 8 through 26. Jesus says, to the unbeliever, I am the Son of God. I've come to take away your sins. John ten thirty six. Jesus says to the wanderer, I am the door. 
John 10 and 9. So who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is Savior. He is Lord. He is sovereign. He is God come in the flesh. He came into the world to reveal God to man that man might know God in a personal way. And we know God in a personal way through Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Who is Jesus Christ? Let's take it out of the theological, doctrinal, philosophical realm. Who is Jesus Christ to you personally? <laughs> is he just the old man upstairs? Is he just the one that's viewed so often by so many as the long white-haired man, long-bearded, sitting on the colonnade, colonnade front porch of heaven in a rocking chair with a cane in his hand, looking down on this earth and kind of shaking his head saying, man, I wish I could do something about the old world. That's the way multitudes identify and look at Jesus as the old man upstairs. Jesus Christ is creator controller of this old world. He is the comforter. He is the one that sustains this old world. He's the one that's watching us every day and every night. He's the one that has forgiven us all our sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west. He's the one that we call Lord, Master, Owner, Savior, and friend, do you know him? Do you know him today? Have you said yes to him as Savior, as Savior and Lord? I pray that you have. Would you stand?